All righty, we are letting everybody in as of now. And we are going to go on YouTube Live. Get this set up as we get started here. Um, four o'clock exactly now. Welcome everybody that's coming into the room. Thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start this YouTube live session. And once that gets started, I'm going to shut it back down so it doesn't get any feedback or echo. And we'll jump right into the meeting here. Give me just one sec. This is uploading and booting up. We've got a couple more people in the waiting room. And we'll jump right in. There it is. Now that's going. That's off. That's off. And we're back to the Zoom session. All righty. Uh, this meeting is being recorded just for everybody's knowledge. Uh, if you do not want to be recorded, uh, keep your camera off. I'm going to go ahead and mute people as they come in so that we can make sure that everybody's quiet here. Um, I have Tierso from UHS Hardware, and he's going to explain a little bit about what this particular Locksmith Live um, Zoom meeting is about and some of the new training opportunities that are going to be available uh, from Jareth Garza from the Locksmith Academy, who's an awesome instructor, and myself, who's going to be some doing some uh, classes on commercial storefront servicing as well. So Tierso, please go ahead and take the stage and let us know what UHS hardware has to offer. How's it going, guys? Uh, my name is Tierso. Um, I'm the Director of Education and Product Manager for our company's website, and I'm, I'm excited to be here with you all today. Uh, our mission with UHS Locksmith Academy is to empower commercial and automotive locksmiths to take their careers to the next level by offering a uh, comprehensive range of training opportunities. Great. Um, so before I go into our kinds of training we offer, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our instructors. These are individuals who are the best in the industry, years of experience under their belts, like Wayne and like Jareth. We are delighted and privileged to work alongside them, and their expertise forms the backbone of our high-quality training programs. Now, uh, we offer four different kinds of training, uh, virtual Zoom training. We offer um, on, online, on-demand recorded trainings, uh, which you can watch on your own pace. And then we offer in-person trainings, which uh, I will get into in a bit. And then we also offer by appointment trainings, um, which is a more in-person, in close personal, smaller groups uh, type of training. That's amazing. Uh, I've noticed a huge, uh, big push in the education department from UHS Hardware. And we can definitely tell that you guys are, are really taking this seriously and strongly. And um, I, we've taught one class. Actually, no, we've done two for you uh, currently. And it was a great experience. I, from the instructor's point of view, we had a great time there. Uh, the students were great. Um, we did double vetting on everybody that came in. Uh, you guys have your vetting system. And then I requested those email addresses and did a, a secondary vetting on our own to make sure that the correct people are in there. Uh, I know that's, you know, uh, very taken very seriously in the industry and I take it very seriously as well. So I just want to let people know that we are going through quite a few um, jumps, jumping through hurdles to make sure that the people who are supposed to be in this class are taking the class properly. And uh, you guys are doing a really good job of it. I appreciate it. The facilities are very nice. I understand there's actually a new hotel uh, that's actually a little bit nicer uh, and has some new training opportunities there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Definitely. So uh, we're gonna we're uh, we're gonna do a, a training week coming up in June, actually, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be part of our in-person trainings, um, which uh, are face-to-face -face sessions and give you the advantage of personal contact with uh, experienced trainers like yourselves and uh, the opportunity to network with other industry professionals. Now, this specific one is, uh, is going to be like June 21st through 24th, I believe. Okay. We're going to offer four, six different courses. Um, Jareth will be teaching two different courses. Wayne will be teaching two. And then we have two other courses by Brian Suggs. And they're going to be at 
the Hollywood Beach Marriott, I believe is the name of the hotel. Yeah, yeah. Hollywood Beach Marriott. Mm-hmm. And it's like right on the water. Uh, you can finish your training and walk over to the beach. Oh, there's nothing better than having having a really nice hotel and resort and a few things to do after the training. Um, you sit in class all day. The, the first thing you want to do is go blow off a little steam, go grab a beer, go talk with your buddies, and uh, just go have a good time and be able to have some other amenities and things to do in that town as well um that it's one of my favorite parts of being an instructor and when i was taking classes uh doing that as well so that's awesome to hear i'm really excited to see this new location um is it can you guys can see my screen correct yes okay good uh so on the calendar here uh what days are you going to be teaching jareth i don't know i can't see the calendar because i'm looking at my phone screen oh sorry uh it looks like 21st and the 22nd is beginners automotive and yep. Uh, yep. 23rd is going to be uh mercedes and i just want to make one correction uh tierso called me the best or one of the best and i feel i'm a rookie for life and another correction would be that i'm not teaching alone i'm bringing my team uh <laughs> paul van neville and eric gutweiler are going to be joining me and teaching all three days so i just want to put that out there yeah, no, great. That's I appreciate that. And, you know, I'm, I'm no by no means the best either. It's just, you know, there, there's there's people that are excited and eager and enthusiastic. And I would say that we are probably some of the most uh, enthusiastic instructors available out there uh, and that we also have good content to go along with it and back it up. It's not the same old, you know, plain PowerPoint, black and white education that you get time after time after time that's kind of exhausted and old it's it's fresh it's new i know you go through painstaking uh you know time to just get your your green screen on there and you know do your thing and make your videos and build your content the way that you build it do you want to go into a little bit more detail about that can you tell us a little bit more about how you set up your training programs and what you put into this i think that's a great question actually um most of my footage is captured on real cars, real situations. You know, a lot of people like to talk about Bosnia and Bill, you know, lock picking lawyer, how good they are, this and that, but they operate under lab conditions. And they also operate alone for hours and they probably film 20 takes and pick the best one. But in reality, when you're dealing with a customer's car and you know you're playing for stakes you don't want to be there all day you have more things to do and you also get tripped up a lot and so whenever we film uh, out in the wild like real world capture we'll often come across things like broken antenna rings and stuff like that and you know therein lies a lesson on troubleshooting is it the key that fails is it the the car that fails is it your programmer that fails it, you know, it teaches you how to jump through a list of triage and, you know, solve the problem. Um, and additionally, I forgot, who is this on the screen? Do you see that? It's gone away now. You're back on. Okay. I'm muting people. <clears throat> additionally, you know, we go capture this footage. A lot of times they're repossessions where people tamper with vehicles or they're just a, a normal car. I'd say a lot that, uh, Let's say a 2014 Ford Focus is not the same car, you know, if it's an if it's owned by an 80 year old lady versus a 16 year old girl. You know what I mean? There's going to be some differences probably in what you encounter whenever you go deal with that certain car. So that's what makes our training pretty cool is uh, just a standard leashy video can turn into a broken door lock actuator. And now even if we have a working key, the car cannot be unlocked. You know, so it's kind of cool, but we have to edit the footage, compile it, edit, produce, and do a ton, just a ton of stuff just to get it worthy of viewing. Yeah, I, I, and I 100% agree. And I've preached that too. I mean, no, no disrespect to those guys that, that have these, you know, amazing lock pickers online, but yeah, you don't see the, the month or two or whatever it was behind the scenes. You don't see him taking apart the lock. You don't see him adding one pin back at a time uh, until they just basically have it on muscle memory. 
and can pick that lock repetitively after, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. And I actually, I used to say that and comment it all the time, that exact phrase, go out and do it in the wild, go up to a Medico or an Austin mm -hmm. Twin 6000 and go do it in the wild and show me. It's always on front of your desk. And again, the, you, it takes a ludicrous amount of skill to be able to pick that lock. So congratulations to them for that. However, that's not the way that it works out in the field. I do hold a grudge because every time I go to a damn car, like I'm, I'm super good. I'm proud of the fact that I'm a, a high skill lock picker. And whenever I pick a car in under 30 seconds, a lot of locksmiths say BS. And I say, I've got plenty of footage to prove it, but the customers will say, looked pretty easy. And I'm like, no, I just make it look easy. And then they start talking about the lock picking lawyer and how he picks locks in under two minutes. And so I think it's kind of degrading whenever you falsely represent. I used to be a lock picker on YouTube. That's how I started. So I know exactly what they do, you know, mm -hmm. and I wish that they would just represent the art, you know, and it's it, it's entirety. It's a whole process, the problem solving, the figuring out, you know, the frustration, the thoughts that go through your head of like, why is it taking so long? <clears throat> is something wrong with the lock? Is something wrong with me? Like, do I need to lubricate it? Like what, you know, all these thoughts, but instead it's just perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and that's the same thing. Well, you know, MacGyver got it done. I get those questions all the time or those comments as they're doing it. And I'm like, cool, well, look up his phone number and have him call you. I'm here now. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like me to go ahead and open this, uh, I'll go ahead and do that for you. But if you'd like somebody else, if you'd like Hollywood to come out here, if you'd like somebody <clears> from <throat> movies, go ahead and find their phone number and have them come out here. And, you know, obviously they start to get the hint right away. Yeah. Um, but Moving on to um, actually the actual program here, uh, Jareth, you've already kind of been introduced. You're an awesome automotive locksmith, uh, very innovative and taking this industry in places it hasn't gone before. And uh, just you, you really have a unique take on things. So without further ado, please go ahead and um, tell us some things about transponder keys, what kind of classes are you going to be teaching? And this is like a little teaser, not so much a teaser that you're going to get some information here, but it's going to give you just a little bit of an idea of what you do and what you're going to get in that class in Miami. Okay. In a nutshell, I don't believe that there is a uniform code when it comes to locksmithing. You see people who say you need OEM only keys or OEM diagnostic tools only. And I think it's ridiculous. Uh, for instance, 10 years ago, CK100 was a Chinese tool and it was balked at. Like if you had it, you were banned out of groups. But now Chinese technology is the predominant technology. So the naysayers, you know, they're completely wrong. At least they were. <clears throat> Adaptability and transponder technology is something that's just constantly evolving. We have non-OEM keys now that this little X-Horse proximity remote can take the place of like 50 OEM remotes. So we can knock down our inventory uh, drastically. Conversely, that opens the door to more people. Less of a cost of entry means more competition can readily step foot onto your turf. So it's kind of a double-edged sword and it's one that I like to, to walk the edge on, you know what I mean? And people will say things like, you can't throw a Ford remote into a Honda, but I say, why not? You know, it's fun to do this kind of stuff because it takes somewhat of a deeper understanding of how uh, cars work because Instead of picking up a part number, going through a database and saying 2013 Honda Accord and it giving you what you need and you picking it off the shelf, you literally have to build your own key from scratch. You have to stick the transponder on the board. You have to plug into it. You have to adapt it and tell it that it's a Ford remote or a Honda remote, and mm -hmm. then you have to program it. So it takes kind of a deeper understanding and it's a lot to learn. But once you understand it, you can save yourself a lot whenever you run out of OEM keys and parts by adapting and building what you need on the spot. 
And the customers really like it because they think that I'm actually custom building their keys. They say, oh my God, you build it right here. I'm like, yeah. Instead of cutting just what they order off Amazon, they see me actually create something from, uh, from scratch. So it's kind of cool. No, that's awesome. And that actually opens up a, a question that I have. Um, I don't, for anybody that knows, I don't do any automotive work. I will open up cars and that's it. That's where I draw the line. I specialize more in commercial work, uh, doors, frames, uh, and safes opening and moving and safes and vaults. Um, we see, I see, I get blasted with all of these, you know, chip keys or transponder keys that are non-OEM versus OEM. And I would not have the slightest clue as to where to start and what to order if I was trying to, you know, get a foothold and work into the automotive side. So from somebody that's coming from very basic background on that, could you explain to people, where would you start? Would you order only OEM or do you have a particular brand that you like or, or what's the foot in the door? Right. Um, there? Easy isn't fun. So I feel like people who kind of lean towards OEM bias and easy route. Um, adaptability saves a day nowadays. So if somebody was brand new, I would tell them, you know, buy an Alltel programmer, even though they took away your rights by uh, making you have to have internet while it's being used. Also buy a key tool max so you can adapt transponder keys, read keys, test batteries, et cetera. A lot of troubleshooting from this tool. This tool will sniff antenna coils. You know, whenever you turn a key, the car will pulse a signal to read the key and say, do I know you? And the key will go, hey, I'm Jeff. And it's like, Jeff, I don't know you. Well, if we're trying to introduce Jeff to the car and the antenna doesn't work, we can determine that if there's a programming failure with this tool. So it's pretty cool. Additionally, if Jeff is the wrong transponder type and he needs to be Jane, we can change him depending on what transponder we use. So buy one of those, buy a programmer, and also buy a ton of leashes. And I would buy the MFK or GTL uh, build a key kit and a lot of super chips. Super chips are just like these remotes over here. Instead of having to carry a whole bunch of these, a super chip basically takes the place of, um, I'd say about 50 transponders as well. So if okay. I need a four, if I need a Ford 80 bit, I can adapt it. I'm going to type this stuff into the chat box. So go over that one more time. What was your, your programmer, Autel? Autel, uh, their choice. If they want to get 608 or 508, I'm not even going to enter that debate. Or 508. And then what else did you have there? Super chips? Yes. And what else? GTL build a key kit. GTL build a key. It also goes by MFK. So, mm -hmm. and also uh, the key tool max. I think this is one of the most important tools that a locksmith can own. Cool. And is most of that stuff available through UHS hardware? Definitely. Yeah, yeah we, we have all those. And we actually just got the new 508S and 608 Pro. <clears throat> Oh, nice. Here, so what's the difference between the S and the old model? Um, I believe yeah. that they are compatible with the XT XT four hundred. I'm by no means a, a professional in any of these things, but I think that the only difference is that they are compatible with uh, more tools. Would you recommend the Autel now that they require internet and they leave some rural customers stranded with uh, no service? That is, uh, yeah, it depends where you're working, I guess. But I mean, nowadays everyone carries around a phone and you could probably just use data, but I don't know. I, as I said, I've never used one of those machines. I don't know what your experience is with using uh, your cell phone's data as a as a backup it works at times but if we have no cell signal in the middle of a cornfield uh we're up the creek without a paddle you know what i mean and that's a lot of us so just something to consider i've, I've always wondered how distributors feel when they sell a product 
and the manufacturer changes it and they take away rights. You know what I mean? As a distributor, yeah. I feel like you guys kind of have a lot of power and what can be said and done. Let me ask you a question. Do you think they did that simply to have more control over it? So let's say, and just <clears throat> forgive my ignorance on this, but it probably works off of a subscription base or some kind of a token. You, you have to continue to pay to continue to use. Did they do that so that they could monitor it and shut you down if you don't pay the bill? Is is that the direction things are headed? Is that why they need it? Or did they do it to constantly update the tool to make it a better tool? In your mind, which which route, why did they do that? Okay, so let me go into detail here. Um, before this was even a thing, Autel, it was Aurora or whatever, and it was grandfathered in. Like they said, if you buy this, you get lifetime updates, you know, for life, blah, blah, blah. And people bought it, and then it Autel purchased or Aurora or whatever, and it turned into the IM508. And it was tokenless. And basically, you know, you get free updates for a year, and uh, you pay a subscription at the end of your, you know, year, and it you get another year. But now they've changed it to where the programmer only works with uh, Wi Fi. And it's not, you connect to Wi Fi. And then it's like, you're good to go for the day. You got to be on Wi-Fi or internet while it works. And the, the reason they say is for security or you're too stupid. You know, let's punish the good guy because the criminals. There's been a lot of Hyundai and Kia theft lately because they're non-transponder systems. And so from what I understand, the National Transportation Security Board or whatever it is, NS, NTSB or whatever, they wanted some kind of change and just like the transponder was introduced to reduce auto theft, now they're targeting the transponder programmer and the programmers, us, and they're trying to limit the criminal's capability or potential through a, a, a leash or a yoke. That way, everything's on the record. And I understand that the good guys should have no problem with this, except for when the techno the technology punishes a good guy. Right. And now, like you said, I, I certainly live in a rural region where I probably have cell phone signal half the time. <laughs> Just and that's from town to town. So there's huge vast areas. I'll I'll tell you that some of the areas here are so remote that even satellite, the manufacturer's satellite like OnStar could not the satellite signal could not reach because of the sheer cliffs in the area. And that's why they had to call me to come open their vehicle. So there are some huge uh, barriers that show up as soon as you you make it to where you have to be attached to internet. Now, obviously, the bigger companies, bigger cities, metropolitan areas, it's not going to be a problem at all. But when I have to have an oil field or a military cell phone booster just to even get a shred of signal to do my job to find my customer, um, it can po po pose some pretty significant problems. Here's a problem: is like before that that update. Like you had complete custody of your programmer. Like if it was doomsday zombie apocalypse, I could go bang out car keys and, you know, survive. That's just a metaphor. I know. But nonetheless, we are dependent on a third party, you know, our cell phone or self-service carrier or hotspot carrier to, um, to operate the tool. They, they took away our freedom to operate. And, uh, you know, I just find that to be wrong. Okay. Um, going back to the uh, the actual creation of car keys and transponder keys, can you can you just back up to some very basic things? What is a transponder key? And what are some of the different kinds of keys that are out there? Transponder keys are predominantly used today. Uh, there's fewer non-transponder car keys. Than there are, you know, uh, tr transponder keys. Transponder is a conjunction. It's uh, transmit and respond. The car will transmit a signal, and it's basically like electromagnetism. It's very cool. So the car stores a code inside the ECU, and that controls start stop authorization, the fuel pump. So if the car cannot get fuel, it cannot go bang and drive. So Whenever you stick a key into the ignition, the car reads it 
and it transmits a signal and the key responds. It says, do I know you? And the key holds a string of data, key seed data. And it says, yes, I'm Jeff. And if Jeff is currently logged inside of the car's ECU or immobilizer, the car will give start authorization and fuel will flow and the car will start. So it's pretty cool. And they started this in Europe because of car theft. And so it's like Europe, a lot of new key systems will start in Europe and they will infiltrate into America. I'll just go ahead and jump in right there for some reason. Well, I guess it's the same thing. It's an older country. Uh, the history goes back further. Safes are the same way. The European safes and locks and containers, they all use keyed locks um, and, and ultra high security stuff. The, the American equivalent is really referred to as a tin can, like even on high security TL rated safes. American yeah. products are usually seen as tin cans or inferior to the UK products. Every time we go out and there's a real nasty high security safe, a tan, a chub, um, you know, just, just some of those really prestigious brands, I the price goes way, way up. And if it's an American rated TL30 or mm -hmm. TL30X6 or whatever, you know, it's usually nowhere near as difficult to get into as some of those top tier containers that come from Europe. So the fact that the automotive industry is following that trend as well uh, is pretty interesting. That's just natural, I think, because even in World War II, the Germans had the Enigma machine and it was driving us wild. Their, their, their ability to encrypt information has always been you know, steps ahead of, of where we're at. And I don't know why it is. I, they're just, they're just better at it. You know what I mean? They're 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 very smart people. Yeah, and I like I said, I think that there's more crime there. Uh, there's more sophisticated crime, and because we kind of came from that area originally, they've just been established longer. Therefore, they've already they've already ran down that road. You know what I mean? Like it's like yeah. It's like when somebody sees a new idea and like five people have the same idea on how to defeat that same lock, you'll see like five or 10 different locksmiths that all come up with the same way to defeat it. Well, that's already happened over there. It's just been going on much longer. It's going on, you know, a couple hundred years more than we've had. Speaking in regard of diversity amongst like manufacturing, you know, countries and such, like that is a big thing amongst automotive locksmiths is what is my potential you know, in regards to what cars I can program and touch. Um, a lot of the new locksmiths will be confronted with just severe challenges such as like EEPROM, transponder technology, you know, what it takes to acquire data, uh, where is a target module, et cetera. And one big thing that a new guy should always consider is what do you want to do? Do you want to do all the cars? Do you want to do domestic? Do you want to do Asian? Like there are several categories and I'll make a recommendation right now. Auto smart by Michael Hyde is how I taught myself. And um, he broke it down initially as, you know, foreign and domestic, but nowadays it's more evolved. It's more domestic BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi, and an Asian. So there's several programmers that one should own. There is no one for all programmer. And automotive. That's great information. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions out there is that you're not going to be able to just get one machine, one program, or one thing, one and done that does it all. You're going to have to. It's it's so far advanced and it's so far complicated. And there's so many different systems out there that you're going to need several different systems. And you're going to need to know, okay, well, I tried, this is my favorite and this is what I go down this way and this is my go-to. But if that doesn't work, you're going to have to have plan B, C, D, E, F all the way till you get the job completed and done. And it's that's probably the hardest part is learning that minimalism doesn't, it doesn't exist in locksmithing. Like you can want one machine, but you're going to need two or three. You can want one programmer, but you're going to need more. You should be able to do the job with one key, but for whatever variable, that key's bad and it won't be accepted. You know, that's just automotive. Automotive, locksmithing, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Right. Now, back to the the keys that we were talking about earlier, OEM versus non-OEM. You're saying that there's different models out there that you might be able to program for different 
version so you don't have to carry so many individual ones of this particular model car from this year to this year you're saying that there's more options out there can you go into a little bit more detail and give perspective from our people that are beginners on the automotive side of things to people that are more advanced as to what you personally carry and why okay i'll give it a shot um when i started i used to carry like every remote because like 07 to 12 Nissan Altima requires a particular remote that has a slot in the side so that you can stick it in to a slot and it programs. And then Murano has one and this car has, Rogue has it, this car has it. Well, with today's technology, we can just take one. And the most important thing that matters here is its button configuration. So we'll open it up and I've got a four button remote standard lock unlock panic trunk same with this one see how this one's chrome yep they also have black chrome these all do the same job this one only works with auto these work with x horse okay so they're proprietary technology but nonetheless your customer calls they've got a 2012 dodge charger they've got a 2011 hyundai sonata They've got a ton of cars. You can adapt it. They've got a Mitsubishi Outlander. You can turn this remote into any one of those, program it through the OBD port. So if I don't have a Nissan Altima slot key, I can adapt one of these to take the place. And additionally, people are like, well, what about the insert key in case the battery dies? You can use a flip key blade that would be NSN 14 and uh, roll pin it in and your customer will have a fully functioning, almost as good as OEM proximity remote. So several of these can take the place of potentially 50 remotes, probably more if you count different bu uh, button configurations. Wow, so that's tremendous for <clears throat> the individual for the locksmith because now I don't have to carry all of those things. You know, like if you have a shop, maybe you have the luxury of having more stock available, but you could run in a smaller vehicle with less stock in the truck. Exactly. Um, we What do they call that? Um, trunk dumping, you know, hump or hatch humping, stuff like that, you know, where you can pop the trunk of a, of a Ford Focus and have your dolphin in there, your key cutting machine, your programmer, have all your stuff. Real quick, I want to break away. Um, I had a 2013 Nissan or a Mitsubishi Outlander. It was a repossession. So it, whenever it was picked and pulled, I believe it was yanked really hard and something was uh, thrown out on it. Whenever we tried to uh, do all keys lost through the OBD port, the car would reject us. It would say secret key code error. And that's the first time I've ever had that happen. Long time ago, like five years ago, Mitsubishi Outlander proximity system was special. MVP Pro couldn't do it. All the high dollar programmers couldn't do it. But now Autel makes it easy. So whenever that Outlander kicked my butt and my friend's butt, we did EEPROM on it. This is an X-Horse adaptable remote. This is nowhere near an OEM. We were able to take the car's computer and extract the key data, the proximity data from the immobilizer, and we were able to push the data into the remote. And so this key, the car already had keys one and two learned. And so we took this and turned this into key one, changed nothing in the car. We put it all back together and uh, it started right out of the box. So I could technically for, for life, if my customer moves to Alaska, I can mail them keys and they will start their car out of the box. And uh, I think that's really great because if we didn't know EEPROM and if we didn't have this option, we would have failed. It would have had to have gone to the dealer. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, obviously we've got a question here from Kelvin. Uh, this is probably one of the most commonly asked questions and I'm curious to see your response. Do you program a remote or key that the customer or client has purchased? And if you do, what do you, what warranty or how do you go about that? No warranty. And yes, I do. Um, if you don't, you lose money because let's face it, uh, keyless to go. Uh, Sean McGuffley's 
little startup. It started on Amazon and he was selling to the end user. And then he started International Key Supply. So that just, that just goes to show you that uh, Sean was highly incentivized to sell to the public because he was making a lot of sales. And if you don't cut those keys, somebody else will. So I feel like you should figure out how you should want to price it. You should offer no warranty. It's not your product. You didn't buy it. It's on them. So I always tell them over the phone, um, there's transponder type, keyway, FCC, et cetera. I hope you did a good job because even if it fails, you're paying me exactly what I quoted on the phone. Okay, so run me through a scenario here. Like you hand the customer a key, they just went through you, they bought everything through you. And that's scenario one. Like they, they just, no quarrels on the price. They just, hey, I need a key. They take your recommendations. And then customer two, they had you program their key. And let's say both people uh, in six months, hey, my key doesn't work. What do you do? I tell my customers that car keys are less like keys and more like cell phones. So you basically get a cell phone warranty, which is out the door, you're on your own. You know what I mean? <laughs> because what are you going to do? Um, your dog can chew on it. You can wash it. You can go swimming with it. You know, you can leave it out in the rain. You can do a lot of things to a car key and it's hard. It's hard to detect, you know, misbehavior, you know, and corruption. So I used to stick, uh, moisture indicators inside the board, but psh, they're expensive and it's bullshit. I mean, BS, you, you, I mean, you shouldn't even warranty the key for a month. Some guys do. I warranty like ignition work for a year. Okay. Yeah. Ignition work and lock rebuilds, you know, they last forever, but something that can just fit and, you know, be thrown and lost, no warranty. Oh, and versus the customer who hands me the key, no warranty. Yeah. No, that everybody joining right here, that's probably uh, a huge piece of information. Keys are like cell phones. That's a that's an excellent comparison right there to just say, this is an electronic device. It can break. Um, it can be abused, and we don't know what you did with it. You know, that's... do you call do you call your phone a cell phone or is it a smartphone? You know what I mean. Right. And are these a key or are they a smart key? You know what I mean. So, I, I believe that a lot of communication can be achieved by putting an image in people's heads. And so if you correlate this with a cell phone and it only calls your car, I, they get it. You know what I mean? That's it. No, no. As soon as you said it, I got it. And that's, like I said, that that's a great, that's a great way to explain it to the customer so that they get it. Oh, I get it. If I get my phone from the store, you know, unless you have insurance or whatever, Surion or whatever on it, as soon as you drop it, whatever happens, uh, you've got a, uh, thousand dollar problem now that you have to resolve and fix <laughs> and it's you can't take it back to yeah, horizon yeah. and say warranty it's not going to happen it, it's it's literally in your hands you know what yeah. i mean so yeah. exactly cool um do you have any kind of can you take one of the keys apart can you show us some of the parts for it or um sure. do you have any other kind um, of demonstration i'll show you something so earlier i took apart this this key it's like a ford style and i put a honda blade on it and I had built this key originally because um, I had an older Honda. It was like a 2004, something like that. And if you notice, there's no transponder on it. And also there's a little socket that you plug into. Like, yeah, it's so hard to see. But there's this little socket right there. That's where you're gonna plug into with your key tool. And you're gonna change the FCC or the remote ID to exactly what you want. You see that? Oh, plugs in? Yep. Plugs in. So this programmer will program your key before you program your key into the car. So that would be a non-integrated remote. If it were integrated, it would have a transponder attached to it. And we would write the remote and the transponder type at the same time. But uh, let's see here, I'm trying to take this key apart, but it's pretty well built. <laughs> of course the oh, one <laughs> this one has an hu 100 keyblade in it which means that a long time ago i adapted it to a gm push to start and so 
in the back of this, which you, you can't take out, is the circuit board. And there's also an induction coil in here. An induction coil shoots a signal. So that's what makes this a proximity remote. And because the induction coil is attached to the remote board, this is integrated. The remote and the transponder will program in at the same time. So that's a big uh, determinator in how you program certain adaptables. Does the system require an integrated transponder remote board or does it require non-integrated? And whatever you choose determines your options of, on what you can adapt. Can you define that just a little bit further, the black and white differences between the two? Uh, Non-integrated remote transponder would be like a, would be like a 2008 Ford Focus. Whenever you'd program the key, the car will learn the transponder, but the remote won't work. So you'll have to onboard program the key. You'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The locks will go ka-chunk, ka-chunk. You'll press a button on the remote, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. You'll turn the ignition off, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. You've now programmed the remote. It took two steps. Now, if it's an integrated remote transp uh, transponder, you'll stick the key into the ignition and you'll say program key and the car will go success. And then you'll take the key out and the remote will work and the key will start the car. One step. Gotcha. Okay, good, great, awesome. Um, what, as far as what we've just learned right here, where does that fit into your training program? Transponder uh, adaptability is my favorite subject. It is the science of it all. You must, I saw that question where someone said, what is a, what are questions you would ask someone on the phone? Year make model, okay? 2012, let's say Chevy Cruze. When they tell me that 2012 Chevy Cruze, I see HU100 Keyblade. There are eight spaces on the Keyblade, eight positions in the door lock, eight in the ignition. I know it's HU100 Lishi, eight cut. It requires a PCF7937 transponder. So that tells me exactly how to build the key right there, okay? Mm -hmm. Programming, it needs a pin code. We can pull the pin code through the OBD. If we can't, we can EEPROM it. There are two routes right there. You see what I'm saying? If pulling the pin code through the OBD fails, we can revert to EEPROM. Um, and additionally, the transponder and remote are integrated. So whenever I program a flip key, one of these, it should go in as soon as programming succeeds. If it doesn't, we have an issue. So there's a lot of things like transponder adap uh, adaptation teaches you the car's system, the locks, the transponder, the remote, and how they work. Because if it only starts a car, but the remote doesn't work, I've probably made a mistake or the car's broken. Right, right. Uh, we got another question up on here. How <clears throat> do you determine what key to use for cars with foreign spec? European, Ford, Japanese, does UHS carry such transponders? Yes, I mean, a lot of distributors carry uh, all of what you need. Um, the best way to look up a vehicle's keyway is, I used to have AutoSmart, but this is your best friend. You can go to uhs.com, year make model, while you're on the phone, you know, 2013 Mitsubishi Outlander, type it into uhs.com. They want to sell you products. They want to sell you the remote. They want to sell you the test keys. They want to sell you the leashy. They want to sell you the programmer. So they typically list pertinent and accurate data. And so you can use distributors as a point of research. And I think a lot of people miss that. You, oh, can, click on the, you can click on the remote key and it will tell you the keyway, transponder type, FCC, part number, a myriad of details. And then people will still say, uh, what, what transponder type does this a car use? And they will send a screenshot of the key. You know what I mean? The devil's in the details and distributors, they are pretty good at listing it right. Because if they don't, you get your money back. 
Right. And this is one of the reasons why UHS, why I really like partnering with them and doing the education for them is because they mm. are adapting to that atmosphere. The atmosphere is changing. Long gone are the days of, hey, we're your supplier and you need us. You know, there's always somebody out there that's ready to take that dollar. Uh, UHS is putting the training together so that the people can be more educated to perform better work out in the field and provide the locksmith with more resources so that they can actually do a more professional job than the scam people that are out there. And that that's one of the things that I like to see a company do. Me too. Uh, I, if I can just say something, that YMM tool that you mentioned, your make model, it's super nif nifty little tool. Um, I, when I first got into business, I didn't really know much about uh, car programming or anything. And that that is very, very, it makes it super easy to search for whatever car key you need. Absolutely. Wait. Yes. When you when you look up a safe, how do you look it up? A database. Is, is it <laughs> is it not is it not a similar pathway where a safe tech has to consider the design, you know, the system, the manufacturer, the yep. time period. Your make model are extremely important and it's it, it cross correlates to different, you know, specialties. Yep. Samuel here is here. Yes. That, no, that's exactly right. But we also have to figure out there's Frankenstein monsters out there too. And that's really common in the antique safes of all things. Obviously, you know, more modern, you can switch and interchange parts more now. But if, if you know, Mosler was out of something and they could get another Diebold part to work and they could send out a shipment, you know, that they would work to be able to do that. And so you may have that safe or that car or whatever it is identified properly. And then you actually get there and it's something, it's a completely different animal and there is no documentation on it. And that's when, that's when you're just going to have to knowledge and experience is going to have to kick in. And you're going to say, it doesn't matter what label is on this thing. Here's what's actually here. And here's what we're actually going to have to deal with to be able to defeat this container so that we can get it open and, and get it repaired and back in service. Same there's thing. Actually, yeah. There's something similar that happened in one of my classes is, uh, that there's a guy in the back who was quizzing me. He said, what would you do if you encountered a Mexican Ford? And that kind of caught me off guard because a lot of Fords, like there's an HEC type and it's HEC, you know, HECO in Mexico, made in Mexico. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I've encountered a ton of them. But he's like, this one was special. Five locksmiths went out to the vehicle and we would pick and decode it with the leash, but every key we cut wouldn't turn any of the locks. And I was like, well, that sounds weird. And he's like, yo, I'm telling you, they had to send it back down to the border and the Mexican locksmiths had to do it. And I was like, why didn't anybody impression it? And I literally saw that guy's jaw drop. Like he was like, I never, I never considered that is what I saw in his eyes. And then he was like, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, I do. And we teach that because if he had known how to impression, you form the key to the lock, you know? You're not cutting to code. You're not cutting to a defined, you know, specified measurement. You're whittling it down and you're getting it to fit and squeeze inside the lock. So if he had known that, he would have been the man who got the job done. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And and that's one of those things where you don't know how that lock's worn over the years. You don't know what it's been through. You don't know all of the other circumstances that have gone into you don't know you don't know who else has been in there tinkering around and working on it for crying out loud yeah facts yeah there's tons of variables um you know cars are just everywhere they go everywhere on every terrain snow rain dirt gravel and you know some systems are just ill-conceived like a you know honda high security they fail like that people will go to the grocery store they'll pull it to a gas pump they'll turn their car off They'll go pay and they'll get back in their car and try to turn it on and it will not turn. So there are just unlimited challenges in regards to what we come across. And it's, it's always a mystery. You never know what the day is going to bring. You never know what the car is going to bring. You can prepare, but you can never quite expect it. You know what I mean? I always yeah. get surprised. And that's, that's, that's what I love about this stuff right here is it's a, it's never a dull day. It seems. 
Right. Um, going back to the questionnaire, when you're talking to the customer, do you ever ask, was this vehicle worked on before by another locksmith? Was this impounded? Was it towed? Are there any key things that you're searching for uh, to, to indicate that there could be a potential problem just based on its history? Where did it come from? An impound lot? Anything like that? Rule number one, never trust a customer because they will always lie to you. So you don't want it to must, be more expensive <laughs> or they will say that their remote had remote start because they feel like if you program a remote start equipped remote, they will suddenly earn remote start in their car. And so, and if you do that, you'll throw a security light and it'll be like, Hey, wrong remote. And the customer will bitch at you, but Hey, you lied to me, customer. You know what I mean? Right. A lot right. Of, well, and a lot of times they don't even have the correct terminology you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm investigating, trying to figure out, okay, well, how many times are you turning it to the left? How many times are you turning it to the right for a safe or something? And like, they, they can't even speak on the same, they can't even speak the same language. This to, is true. And I used to ask my customers when I would unlock their cars, like, which way do you turn it to unlock it? And they would say, uh, to the left. And they were always wrong. And so I learned, just <laughs> go, you know, if you're not sure, use your brain. I always look at a vehicle's brake rotors to see how long it's been sitting because surface rust builds quickly, less than a week. And yep. so the, am the amount of surface rust on brake rotors is indicative of how long it's sat without moving. And that's one thing I use. You can also look at battery voltage. Battery voltage, pretty good usually until like a week or two and it starts to dwindle. So there, there, are, there are signs that you can use you know you, you're a detective man so that's what i the biggest problem i have is whenever people go to a job and they're problem solving and they can't solve the problem because they're not trying to solve it they're, they want the answers thrown at them you need to go there and you need to work through it you know what i mean yeah because there could there could be a myriad of variables that you're you're, you're going to come across absolutely absolutely let's go back to the question board here uh tierso i just want to confirm this one with you uh, when it said the the question of uh, how do you determine what key to use for the foreign cars uh, spec, and then do you carry does UHS hardware carry those transponders? UHS does carry those transponders. Uh, as far as the how to determine uh, what key to use for foreign spec cars, I'm not really sure how to answer. As as I said, I'm not a I'm not a professional uh, by any means. You search the year making model. Gotcha. on the website and it'll 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 show basically everything you need to know also mvp pro uh pdf on google if you type in advanced diagnostics mvp pro pdf it'll it'll pull up one of the best free um guides that you can get yeah by and if you really spec, by foreign spec uh okay so foreign spec was just me referring to like toyota uh, nissan oh, yeah. okay got it got it I, I thought we were going back to the uh, how you said that there was a specific kind of spec for like a Ford from Mexico, because uh, I know like Mercedes, uh, I know Mercedes has different models in Europe, um, like they have like a C200 or something, which we don't have over here. Right. Mm. How so would it's that gonna, work? It sounds like it's going to kind of determine, it's going to be based off of the information that you can get off of the car, or off of the vehicle itself. You're gonna to have to identify that that's a foreign vehicle, and then you're gonna to have to do more, much more research in order to it find just it. it just takes research. So, you know, it's, let's say somebody has a 2018 Mercedes, and I'm gonna make up like, you know, C240 or whatever. And they look it up and they find a Fobic, and that Fobic says that it goes to a lot of cars. Well, if they go out to the car and plug in their programmer, their programmer is actually gonna tell them, you can't do this car, only the dealer can. So there are, you know, there's a hundred systems out there that we come across, only a very few of them we, can, we, we can't do, but typically very simple research is gonna get you the information that you need to know, you know? It's, this stuff isn't hard to find. Right, right. What would your recommendation, what's the, what's the best resource for that information right now? Uh, the internet. Everything. No, 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 but I, I, obviously, but like one, a page, a group, uh, whatever. The one best place. 
see the the entrepreneur in me is supposed to say this right here but i don't be- i don't believe that there is only one best place i believe that Not free. well the locksmith should know how to research period they need auto smart if they're new because it's going to teach them systems and stuff they're going to need you know distributor their favorite one that's going to teach them what transponders go to which car and then they can use us for you know guides almost every vehicle if they don't know how to do it they can use us because we will show them step by step by step by step um but generally the locksmith needs to become a master of research period yeah yeah so they're going to have to rely on themselves uh the groups are helpful the uh the suppliers can be helpful as well and you know pages like your page uh other ones out there there's a bunch of different groups and and academies and you know just education facilities out there but just getting familiar with one and actually using it and the biggest piece of advice that i would offer to people is don't just show up and say hey i have this what do i do with it that's going to get that's going to get you know that's going to irritate some people if you don't at least show that you've done some research. Hey, I've tried X, Y, and Z, and this is still not working. Now I'm stumped. Can somebody help me out a little bit? That's going to get you a whole lot further. And using that little search magnifying glass feature is going to help out a lot to make sure you can help find your own information versus just showing up there. There's always that one person who's coming back and constantly asking the same question over and over and over again. I think that the locksmith needs to become extremely familiar with failure because it's the stuff that kept me up at night that really pushed me. And I see a lot of false or mis- misplaced expectations with new guys who will buy the tools, the keys and stuff, every, check every box that says, yes, I can do the car. And they go out to the car and, hey, how do I do this? You know, they need, like you said, they need to learn how to appreciate that struggle. You know, that struggle really builds a lot of experience. And if you just jump on and ask for help, they're going to tell you to call a locksmith. <laughs> yeah. That brings me to a great question. Uh, Yelvin has said, and I, I think I know the answer to this one for you, but we'll, I'll, let's see what you have to say. When do you determine that it is time to walk away from the auto job? That's a good question. Um, if you've ever seen Pulp Fiction, Marcellus Wallace tells Bruce Willis that pride it's a motherfucker. You know, whenever you start losing money on a job, you're, you're, you're spending three hours trying to make $200 and you're losing a $200 call here, a hundred dollar call here, another there. You Doesn't need matter. to learn how, yeah, you, you gotta matter. learn how, to, you gotta learn how to cut, you know, your, your, yourself loose sometimes, but pride is very difficult. You know, it's a difficult hurdle and I've spent three days on a car. You know, I won't lie about it. And uh, I still didn't get it done. So, you know, that builds that builds a better me, though, because I I stayed up many nights researching what I did wrong. Yeah, well, and that's the same for me. I mean, I've had, you know, containers and safes and yet today I haven't had one that we couldn't open. Um, but some of them have taken three days. Some of them I've had to come back, you know, two or three weeks later and and finish that job. And there's a little bit of a difference there. You know, safes don't really move anywhere and they're usually not as um, immediate. It doesn't require as immediate attention, but it can be frustrating. And each failure is simply learning, okay, that did not work. I'm not going to do that again, but I did learn something. I learned that that didn't work. And now we try a different aspect and a different approach to it. Okay, well, that didn't work. That didn't work. Well, pretty soon we've got a long list of things that didn't work. And there's only so many solutions to the problem. So you're basically process of eliminating until you get down and find what that exact problem is. Edison's saying of he didn't fail a thousand times. He figured out the right way to create a light bulb. You know, yeah. he said, those, those weren't failures. Those were just leading me down the right path to the one true invention so and on top of that how many other inventions did he come up with because of all of those failures those failures were documented the only difference between what do they what do the mythbusters used to say the difference between science and messing around is writing it down (laughs) i I like that yeah i like that kelvin's got a question go ahead sir unmute if you'd like and go ahead 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. Well, Jareth, you're like the locksmith guru, man. This this is great information. Great information. Um, I've always told people the, the best thing the locksmith can do is have the ability to think. I mean, you got to think your way through some of this stuff. And, you know, I have a son that goes with me on jobs and I tell myself, I hope we find something that we can't fix. So you'll remember this and you'll struggle through this and you won't forget this lesson. So I think that's very important. But one of the things I want to ask you concerning automotive locksmithing, and I don't do a lot of it, but every now and then I get these calls where the customer doesn't tell you the truth. The car has been sitting there three or four days. They say, hey, I just need a key. So you go there, the battery's dead, the car has been sitting. Then finally you boost the car, you boost the battery, you try to make a key and something else is going on with it. How do you get to past the point of, this is what I initially charged you, but now I find I got to do some kind of e-prom work or something else. Do you give them a range of pricing or how do you deal with that situation? Because I'm just finding people call me and all of a sudden it's not for what they call for, it's something else. Hmm. That's good. Um, I find that people, if you talk to them, like you talk through your thought process of how this car should have took me five minutes. You know, the steering lock should have gone work, but it didn't. And now that it didn't, we have a big problem. You know what I mean? So I, I often approach the customer just bluntly, like I can fix it or I list their options. You know what I mean? And I mean, it, it's, it's just rule number one, never trust a customer. The customer doesn't know. The customer's playing for keeps, you know? They're your opponent oftentimes. So you just gotta, I don't know, just confront them honestly is my best advice. Yeah, and it it really does seem, I get that call all the time too. Oh, I just have, you know, that's my favorite thing. I'll just come pop the lock or come, you know, program a key real quick or come, you know, just pop this safe open real quick. And those are key buzz terms that I've used. The best defense, and this, this goes to, to Calvin too, is the best defense that I've come up with so far is having a, a, a proper checklist. And I can usually sniff out what's going on on the phone just because of the questions that I'm asking. When was this container opened last? Who opened it? What exactly happened? And then all of a sudden I show up and this is where it starts to differentiate a little bit. It's pretty easy for me to get a picture of a safe and I can see whether it's fallen on its face during a move or scratched or tore up and that we're going to have some significant issues and hurdles to to deal with mm -hmm. with that container now that i see that sometimes you, you probably don't get that in the automotive industry but i can get a lot of details and i usually know what i'm walking into about <clears throat> at least 80 percent of the way by the time i get on the job just through the phone conversation and previous data collected i tell customers that cars are like people they can look super clean and healthy, but once we get into the system, we may find some cancer. So you just never know. You just never know. Cars are complicated. They're like a robot. They are a robot. So there's a ton of things that can happen. Yeah. And so when you get to the job site and let's say it's not what was explained on the phone, before you touch anything, do you just, you know, hey, we can walk away now. I can charge you a service call or here is the list of items. I can either try and program a key. It's got a 50% chance of working, but it may not. And we're still going to have to pay for that. Or we can, you know, deep dive into this thing. And I'm going to be working on this for the next two hours. It's going to cost you $800 and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make sure that you have a key at the end of it. It's a, it's a double-sided coin. If the customer is earnest and they, they lie to me like in good faith because they didn't know, then I, I will walk down the rabbit hole with them. I will explain. I won't charge a service charge if somebody is just completely um, ignorant. And it, there's, I want to make a point here. Ignorant and arrogant, they sound alike, but they're different. Ignorant is, I don't know better. Arrogant is, I know better, but I don't care. So if they're ignorant, I'm generally more forgiving. But if I get to the, the place and the customer is arrogant, it's my problem, not their problem then I generally walk because cars are a sandwich that once you, you take a bite of, you carry it with you. They will call you for the dumbest stuff. My tire keeps going flat. <laughs> my radio doesn't turn up all the way. It's every cent you club. Every cent you worked on my car, you know, this happens. I get a speeding ticket, you know? So, you know, I, I operate 
generally under extreme prejudice. And by prejudice, I mean risk reward. <laughs> it's a ratio. It's a fraction. Is the risk on top or is it below? You know what I mean? So that's generally how I operate when I, you know, approach a car or a problem. Yeah. And that's, that's excellent. That's, I mean, that's a mechanic problem too. And yeah, you have, you, you take it to a mechanic, you take your vehicle to a mechanic and they replace the alternator. And like you say, you get a flat tire and all of a sudden that's all, somebody else's problem. And of course, nobody wants to pay for anything. Automotive keys are expensive and you obviously charge a professional premium rate for that. Um, you're, you've got to be one of the top tier people in your area. Um, they want to come back after you charge them four, five, six hundred dollars and say, well, now this other stuff doesn't work. That's the kind of stuff you need to protect yourself from. What kind of precautions do you have in, in lieu of that? Do you have a, a pretty rock solid disclaimer that was made by an attorney? What ro Roll me down the road. What happens when that phone call comes that the alternator doesn't work and my car won't start because you replaced my key five years ago? Damn. All right. So when I was just beginning, I had all the OEM programmers. I had MVP Pro. I had Stratech Y164 keys. You know, I had all the stuff that I was supposed to have. I had a customer with a 2008 or six Dodge Magnum. And it was just, I lost the key. Can you make me a key? So I go out there and by God's grace, I got the key to turn on my last one because I was new. I was just learning. And once I got the key to turn the ignition, I saw the security light. And I was like, yes, plugged in my programmer. Mind you, MVP Pro costs tokens. So every time you pull the pin code, token, and every time you, you program, token, they were $25 each. And so the security light would go out upon programming. I would turn the key off and then turn it back on to try to start the car. And the light would blink the car would not start. I spent hours out there trying to remedy the problem and same result. So I was like, oh, well, I fail. I gave the customer the key and said, sorry. And she was like, you tried so hard, thank you. A month later, I got a call and she threatened me with a lawsuit, negative reviews on Google, Yelp, every place I was listed. She said, you fried my car. And I was like, bullshit, you know? What I did was standard and I use all the good equipment. She's like, if you don't fix this problem, I'm going to sue you. So I said, take it to the dealer, let them diagnose it. The dealer comes back at my insurance company with a $10,000 bill. They said the entire computing system is fried and they need to do a swap. <sighs> now, there was really no way she could have proved it was me. And there was no way I could have really proved that it wasn't me. So there was a, a locking of opponents right here. And I took the easy route out and made an insurance claim to appease the dragon lady. And I paid her $10,000 and my premiums went up. And my insurance agent said, if you ever do it again, we might have to kick you. And I was like, first year of business. That led me to EPROM. That led me to the PCM failures of magnums and chargers, and I fixed them all the time. If I had known what I know now, I would have spit in her face. I would have fixed it, and I would have charged her $1,200. You know what I mean? Right. But because I didn't know that, I made a $10,000 insur $10, insurance claim. The point of this story, though, my insurance agent told me five years later, I wish he had told me this before. He said, it's almost impossible for a customer, customer to prove liability whenever there is an electrical problem. Because when it comes to courts and juries and peers and people who have opinions, electronics is extremely hard for people to understand. So I would say that to people who are worried about liability in regards to programming, what I do is I record on my cell phone the whole procedure, the whole programming procedure. And there, if ever someone says something, you can save your video file according to VIN or whatever. If anybody ever comes at you with anything, you have irrefutable proof of your work and the process that you did. Right there again, that's another huge chunk of information for anybody that's listening or watching. 
uh, recording your work and making sure that you build in covers for yourself and protections, cover your assets, if you will. Um, that would be the equivalent of like doing a safe installation. Uh, we go in and the first thing we do is we video and take pictures while we're videotaping so that you can have the still images that we can blow up and get extremely detailed photos of the driveway, the concrete, the doors, the art on the walls, the floor, the marble, the tile, everything, all before we even set foot in the house. And then we have another one of it moving along the way, random photos, which just ends up as content into the training programs. So it helps out both ways. And then at the end, we go back through when the safe is completely done and we go back and we take pictures of it again. Same thing, saved my bacon. Uh, <clears throat> I, we were moving a safe into a, a house for a very limited time. It was like a Louis Vuitton party or something. And we've got 40 dudes moving statues and furniture and fish tanks. I mean, you name it, this stuff was in their kitchen equipment. And all of a sudden, they had some damage done to the stairs. And we put down a bunch of protective stuff on the stairs and no other company did. And they came at me and they're like, you ruined the staircases. You're buying all new flooring. We're suing you for like, you know, $127,000 or something ridiculous. Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, you're in a $75 million mansion in Aspen for crying out loud. And so I'm kind of panicky and I'm like, well, we took photos before and after. And I'm like, look at the photos. It plainly shows that there were splinters and little things that were laying on the floor that with the tape that we put down and the protection couldn't have possibly been from us because it would have stuck to the tape when we peeled it back up. And because I had that documentation and evidence, I was like, hey, you know, if you want to go forward with this, go ahead. But we're going to send all this into the insurance company. You're going to get busted for insurance fraud because it wasn't us. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, I have photographic and video evidence of the other 40 dudes running around here from different companies moving a bunch of ludicrously heavy stuff. You just thought it'd be easiest to pin the damage on the safe guy. And that's what happened here. And that documentation totally saved my bacon on that. It's just like, you know, forensics, <laughs> it's like, you know, if you were in court and they were trying to forensically prove that you were at fault, your evidence would, you know, be your salvation. So it's just a very easy, and the hardest part is learning how to store data and organize it, you know? And people will say like, if you have all this customer data, isn't that like a liability of a hacker stealing your customer's data? Well, no, it's not. No one's gonna care. No one's gonna watch 16 hours of footage of bop, bop what I mean? A car alarm going off. So it's completely safe to store footage. And like, you know, Wayne said, it could save you $127,000. That's wait. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, if I'd have made that claim, I might've got booted right then and there. Oh yeah. I would have, you know, it put me in like suicide watch. That's <laughs> scary. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Arthur has a question. Go ahead, Arthur. Well, I just had a comment on what you're talking about, um, I'm using the um, Altel 508. And I, when I go in to program a car, I always, I just started making this a habit of always doing a, a, a pre-scan. Yep. And the post-scan while I'm through, because I went through a situation where, oh, oh, my radio doesn't work now since you programmed the key. Mm -hmm. So, that, that's I, I taking actually, precautions. Yeah, I, that's a good. That's a very good point. Actually, in the last class that uh, we taught in uh, Miami or Fort Lauderdale, I think they're the same city. I don't know, but um, Eric actually taught me that, or it's Paul, that you can anytime you do an emo status scan on your IM five hundred eight or your six hundred eight, it will log it and it will save it so that you can go back and refer to it. So. Honestly, I forgot to do that. I said in class, I was like, after that, every car I plug into, I'm doing an emo status scan. I have honestly forgot to do that. And I appreciate him bringing that back up because that's a that's an amazing tip. Your Autel will log it so you can go back and refer to it even six, you know, six months or a year later. That's that's great. That's, thank you for bringing that up, Arthur. I appreciate it. And I mean, we're not getting into a whole lot of super technical data right here, um, but just the couple tips that have been provided to keep you safe and keep you a little more protected or maybe open up your eyes to some options to protect yourself against 
you know, possible insurance claim or something going on with the customer uh, mm -hmm. are, are totally worth it. Uh, and go ahead and explain what else, what are you going to be offering? Explain what's going to be taught at your two classes. Are they beginner? Are they intermediate? Are they advanced? Are they all of the above? Walk somebody through. What is somebody going to get when they sign up to take your class or classes? All right. So it's basically the class is defined by who attends. Uh, my favorite thing to do is to approach a class with a blank schedule. We start basic. We're going to start with like showing you how to do like edge cut keys, you know, non high security. We're going to show you how to take a door lock apart, how to use a leashy. But what I do before the class uh, even begins is I ask everybody their name. And I say something you're good at and something you're bad at and something you want to learn. And so they will give me basically ideas to help build the curriculum as I go. Because as I march through the content, we have over, I think, 1,300 videos. So we literally can show almost anything. Um, we also bring locks. We're going to, all right, so day one's going to be leashy mostly. We're going to talk about locks, how key systems work, how the HU100 correlates to GM and all that, and then how the HU100R correlates to BMW. There are little nuances and differences. We're going to discuss that. Day two is basically going to be programming and like what is going to make you money, the bulk of what you're going to see as an automotive locksmith. We're not going to go into a lot of EEPROM, but we will go into some because even the basic locksmith should know a little EEPROM nowadays. Um, day three, is Mercedes, Mercedes Focus. We're gonna show key ignition, uh, EEPROM. We're gonna show KR55, AR32, VVDI Prog, VVDI MB, uh, some Diag Speed, Autel, tons of tools with Mercedes. And uh, I'm by no means a Mercedes expert, but my team and I can put on a hell of a class and I wouldn't miss it. It's actually one I'm very excited about because we're gonna have EIS in class. We should have a wiring harness so we can technically program a car in the classroom. So it's gonna be pretty cool. That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, I highly recommend people take the hands-on approach and actually get in the seat. This is where, you know, there, there's only so much you can learn. And I love that your, your website is video-based, mine's video-based. You can learn a lot and you can get a good foundation. You can get a lot of understanding. But a lot of times what I tell people is, is those video training programs, they may bail you out of a tight spot, but really what they do is if you take some of those programs and you learn through the video content, it prepares you so that you can absorb much more and your dollar goes much further in the live hands-on class. You're going to ask more intelligent questions. The information is going to sink in further and it's an aid to the live hands-on. There's never going to be a total replacement for that. I don't care how good video technology gets. It's just not going to be the same thing as touching, holding. And like you said, all your stuff is in the field. All my stuff is in the field. It's not on the bench. It's something that's been in production for a while. It's something that's got weird quirks that don't happen in a pristine, clean, sterile environment. Yeah, we operate in reality. Exactly. You know? Um, um, there's one more question over here and then I'll just open up the floor to anybody else. Any more questions? We are coming up on about an hour 20. Uh, so just any other questions, comments, concerns, please raise your hand. We'll call on you if you'd like to speak, or if you'd like to put a question in the notes section or in the chat section, uh, we can get to it there. It says, uh, there are some places outside the country where people use to swap out motors of a car and put a totally different car motor or matching ECU which a locksmith may not know what that ECU is, a totally different, you, you understand where this is going, right? Sure, but is he asking a question? Yes, and it says, how do you determine what transponder key to use? And is there a tool to determine that for you by pulling it off the ECU that is installed in the car? Jesus, there's like five questions there. Uh, first <laughs> off, if somebody's swapping a motor and ECUs, uh, you better be specialty. Sounds okay. chop choppy. Oh, yeah. And I get that question a lot. Like, you know, well, we switched to ECU and car no start, and then we program key and still car no start. Well, you know, something's not lining up. You know, there's probably a VIN mismatch or some data is missing or whatever. So 
I don't know, man. If you're doing that kind of stuff, you need to be a pretty solid locksmith. You need to have tools that can do like ECU reading on the bench so that you can actually look in the data and graph it and see if the VIN or the secret key code data is there. I mean, if you understand EEPROM and what numbers are shared and passed along, you can actually, you know, you can determine whether or not a part is OEM. And oftentimes if it's, or uh, original, and if it's a donor, oftentimes you can adapt it with EEPROM. So there's, you know, that, that goes into what do you want to do? What do you want to do as an automotive locksmith? Do you want to just make the easy keys or do you want to program race cars? You know, it's potentially limitless the trouble you can get into. Right. Okay. Do we have any other questions uh, from people in the meeting here? Questions, comments, and concerns for Jareth, uh, myself, Tierso, uh, training, any anything with the facilities, uh, anything about content or coverage, please ask it now if you do have any questions, and we'll be happy to answer them. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the link to the schedule, the training schedule, uh, where people can take a look at all the courses we'll be offering in June. Okay, cool. That's in the notes section right there. That's awesome. Kelvin says, this is excellent. I'm looking forward to this class. Jareth, you are a locksmith auto guru. Uh, motorcycle training, anything offered for motorcycle training or keys made for that, Jareth? Sure, I can show some stuff with motorcycle training. Absolutely. Okay. Is, is that currently scheduled for the event that you're doing, or is that more something that's in your locksmith academy? And go ahead and feel free to, to plug that and you know tell us about your locksmith academy too. I mean, we have motorcycle videos in the academy. Um, we will show whatever you want, basically, so long as it uh, it toes the line. You know, we're not, if you're in a beginner's class, we're not going to show you, you know, Volkswagen, Audi, EPROM. You know. You can go to the advanced, you know, Euro class. I think Brian Suggs or Scruggs is teaching that. So um, I lost my train of thought. I'm going to be completely honest with you. <laughs> Motorcycle training at this event. Mo Motorcycle training. Yeah, we can show it. No problem. Uh, motorcycles are pretty easy generally. And um, I mean, we can show you how to make motorcycle keys in less than an hour probably. Awesome. Unless it's BMW or something. I had to tangle with one of those. And actually, one of the worst opens I think I ever had was a B, the key was locked in a BMW motorcycle that had BMW factory stowaway little compartments. And you had to have the key to get the thing open. Mm -hmm. uh, that ended up being quite a nightmare. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Foreign motorcycles are pretty extreme. You need a lot of expensive programmers to even handle, you know, the programming, like they're transponder equipped, a lot of them. A lot of American or domestically, you know, sold motorcycles are not transponder equipped. So um, they're pretty easy to deal with. And also lots of people turn them down, just like Toyota and stuff, because they have this like, this image in their head that it's too hard, it's scary, it's too expensive. But whenever like a customer loses a key to a motorcycle, they typically have an ignition, a gas cap, a seat lock, a helmet lock, and maybe a something else like a cargo carrier. So for them to replace all the locks on that motorcycle and not choose you, it's it's incredibly more expensive. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, I, the the locksmith is highly incentivized to learn how to deal with motorcycles, at least in America, because we have it way easier than our, you know, our German counterparts. Yep. I will tell, I will go ahead and fully admit the worst, one of the worst things that kicked my butt for more than, it took hours and hours and hours. I had actually just got this tattoo finished and I'm bleeding. It's like 80 degrees, 90 degrees out. And I'm trying to get into an Italian imported scooter, a scooter mm. and the seat clamshell locked with the key inside. And I, I mean, we, I tried to do everything on that thing. We tried to bypass, trying to find wires, cables, everything. I called the uh, 
uh, the local place that works on ATVs and motorcycles and stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, don't even think about getting that open. <laughs> We've pulled the motor out of it, like totally and completely just disassembled the entire bike and they couldn't get the damn thing open still. I ended up having to use uh, safe techniques to where I ended up drilling a hole by the lock and just kind of poked around until I found something to release the doggone thing. One of Jesus. the worst experiences ever and actually... Out of all the giant safes and TL and vaults and stuff that I've opened, a scooter, a janky scooter imported from Italy is one of the worst uh, foes that I have encountered out in the field. Did you charge your customer uh, to vandalize their scooter? I'm no. kidding. I'm uh, kidding. Well, no, no, no. I, char <laughs> I charged him to get it open. Yes, I did. I should have charged a ludicrous amount more, but like you said, it's back to that ego thing. This thing's not going to beat me. I don't care if I have to come back. I'll stay here all night. It's once I lock horns with it, man, that that's it. There's no, it's like a pit bull with a bone. It just, I got it. I got to get it. Or there has to be some crazy extreme circumstances for me to turn loose of it before. we. I've had uh, customers lock their keys in a, like Mercedes Benz trunks and Mercedes Benz are like, safes you know in regards to the trunk usually behind the seats there's no access it's like steel and a lot of times they'll tear their seats out thinking that they'll have something to punch through and they're confronted with Dong! you know what i mean so it's it's pretty funny you know you had to drill that open you should see what you know some of us have seen with people putting holes in their mercedes this big so that they can try to stick their arm and you know grab the hood release or the trunk release i mean so it's pretty I funny no, yes. And I did not I did not drill the lock. There's no lock to drill. You had to have the ignition in a position that would then unlock the seat. So hmm. what I drilled for was the mechanical. It it always goes, no matter how many electronics are involved, there's a catch and there's a release. And yeah. I found the release. Yeah. Uh Yamaha, I think it's a Vino or something like that. It has that where you can one way is to start I the think bike. That was, I and, think it was very similar to that, yes. Yeah, the other way pops the gas cap in the seat, yep. Yep, exactly, exactly. And it was, I mean, it was just, I don't know. I just thought it was funny. It's like we open all these gigantic safes and vaults and everything, and what gives me the most trouble just leaves me red in the face mad, a scooter, a janky mm -hmm. little scooter. <laughs> to the guy who said we used to drill behind the license plate, um, I actually had a customer do that on a BMW. I had to walk from his BMW because he had he had tried to open it every which way, and I was afraid that if I had touched it, I'd be you know blamed for it. And um, I at least let him borrow my drill, and he removed his license plate. I couldn't believe he was doing it, which is why I let him do it. And he he put a hole behind his license plate to again snake through and pull that little release cable and i was like i was like man you know good on you that's your car but damn it was a sight to see you know what i mean yeah definitely on a bmw mm. yeah <laughs> well this has been an excellent um meeting thank you so much for sharing some of your knowledge with us uh thank you for putting on the class we definitely need like i said highly energetic uh motivated and mostly, and this is the most important feature, enthusiastic educators in our industry right now, there's a huge change coming. There's a lot of the old guard that are no longer able to teach or don't want to, or they're dying off. And uh, there's a whole new level of educators that are coming up. And it's just an honor to be part of that with you and working with uh, UHS and, and some of the other manufacturers out there and the other organizations to bring this information to people in all sorts of new ways and shapes and bring new fresh content in new packages to the people. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, do we have dates? Do we have time and dates for those classes? Yes, yeah, they should all be uh, chronologically ordered. Um, and then uh, I think at the top, You'll find the uh, you'll find our first up and coming course, which is Magic Motorsports on the on May twentieth, and then right. under that is going to be the rest of them, which is uh, the two that Jareth and his team are teaching, uh, the two that you will be teaching, and then Brian Suggs is going to be teaching too. Alrighty, well there it is. You can go to uhshardware.com. Uh, Tirso, Jareth. Everybody else, thank you for joining the meeting here. Uh, next Monday, 
we're going to be going over the classes that I'll be teaching with the commercial locksmithing and electronic access course. So, Jareth, uh, invitation, you're more than welcome to pop in and say hello, uh, share whatever you have to share, and uh, we'll be back here next week and we'll go over some of the stuff that we're going to do there. I believe I'm actually going to be covering one of the, the an installation. We'll be doing a full installation in the program here. It is a product that is only available through UHS hardware right now, which is the Lockley storefront uh, door electronic lock. It's standalone access. So cool. It's got app controlled access, fingerprint, credential, pin code, key override, uh, and it pretty much installs on an alarm lock 1300 platform from almost any storefront. So very, very cool products. I don't think I've really seen anybody else cover that product too much yet. And uh, it's going to be a game changer. It's going to be something that if you can install a regular mechanical lock on the door or you can install an alarm lock, you can install this and you can give them all of these crazy features. So really cool stuff for next week. Awesome stuff for this week. With that, we'll... Uh, if I could just say up. something real quick. This was, an awesome, this was an awesome podcast. And uh, thanks to the people who asked questions. Like that was really cool. You know, getting to see their faces and talk to them. So um, yeah, if you don't do this style, currently Wayne like with people popping in I think you should oh yeah really cool. no no no. we we usually open it up we had uh, maximum and peaked out at 23 today uh a lot of times it's just the participation as the it's snowballing but we don't yeah. always get a, a manufacturer support to go out through their channels as well and and be able to build that audience so definitely right and really for the people that's a great point the people that ask questions there's other people sitting in this room thinking about the same questions that you're thinking about. They just had the bravery to go ahead and ask them, and it helps the entire group, right? I mean, somebody's question is going to help five or 10 other people in the group. So questions are always encouraged. Mm -hmm. Those are my favorite kind of people. Exactly. Curious. What yeah. are you going to learn? What are you going to learn if you don't ask a question, right? Exactly. So excellent stuff. Well, with that, let's wrap it up. Have a wonderful day. And we'll see you next week, same time, same channel. Thank you. Thank Later. you, Jared. Thank you, Wayne. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you.